Give me one minute, yeah? Yeah. OK. OK, so welcome to the second to last day of this Gyan course. So I was asked by a couple of people to talk a bit more about um, my institution and some of the things we do. OK, so I'll do that for five minutes. Um, so as you know, I'm, I'm actually working at Trinity College Dublin. Well, the, there are a couple of ways where you can see what, uh, you know, what the college is about. Of course, we have our website, um, www.tcd.ie. IE is like the internet suffix for Ireland. So here you see pretty much, you know, they have like breaking news and you can, you know, you can actually, there are some videos presenting, you know, uh, the college and the research and the teaching. So, you know, it's, uh, I think it, if you just navigate it a bit, this is actually our provost. Provost in the British system is the, I think what you call director at IIT, chancellor maybe in other parts uh, of India, but basically the president, okay, is the who boss of the university. Um, is, is a nice guy, actually. I, I can tell you he's a nice person. Okay, um, that's one thing. Then research-wise, so let's say Trinity is my kind of uh, reference point for teaching, okay? And, uh, and I'm an employee of, of Trinity eventually, but I would say probably 95% of my time I spend it in, uh, in my research center, which is actually a bit outside of the main campus. Of, I mean, very, very close, like 100 meters outside, but it's something else, so it's, um, I, I, I am, a, a senior researcher in the National Telecommunication Research Center. So that's really where I have my office and I do most of my work. And then, you know, I, I interact with college for teaching and other things. I now and then go to the college premises, but I, it's, it's kind of two things, okay? So there is teaching where I, I, I basically interact with the college and I am an employee of the college in the end, but then practically speaking, I'm, uh, research and my daily job has to do with, with CONNECT, which is the National Research Center. Uh, so it, you will see, I mean, if you just again browse a bit, uh, you can see the research areas, the test beds. Um, so it depends on what you're interested in. So the, the way the CONNECT work is structured is based on teams. So you have, for example, people that are targeting reduction in the energy consumption, people that are talking about sharing of resources, uh, densification of networks, converged uh, networks between wireless and optical, so, uh, and so on and so forth, moving networks. Actually, these are uh, very interesting topics. So these are the guys that are doing molecular communication. So they study, for example, how the neurons communicate or how you can use actually information theory and, and communication uh, uh, you know, um, theory to, to actually improve the communication within the body, for example, for diagnostic or drug delivery purposes. Okay, so they, they do this kind of thing. These guys are also working into terahertz because they, this kind of short ranges, uh, you know, go well with this kind of networks. So you will have also a section on, on test beds. So there are two main ones, as far as I'm aware, there might be more. Um, one is actually, it's pretty much about the cognitive radio dynamic spectrum access story, okay? And they're also evolving it toward 5G. So they have um, software defined radio platforms. I think they use new, new radio and USRP. So you will see actually what they do. So you see we have, uh, they explain the architecture and uh, they basically have, uh, you know, um, a set of, um, antennas and you know they can do uh, quite a bit of experimentation so they explain you how to set up an experiment as far as i know if you ask for permission you you might be able to use it remotely so it's something you might be interested in and again it's probably easier for you if you contact me and then i'll dispatch the message okay to the right people i i know i know very well the people working with this experimental lab with this experimental part of the center i'm not doing that really okay i, I do interact with them but i'm more of a theoretician, but I, I know them very well. They're very good. And as far as I know, they're very happy collaborating. And because one of the purpose of building this infrastructure is also to make it uh, useful. So it doesn't have to be locked in our college. Actually, the purpose is the opposite. They want to open it up. And yeah, it should be fairly easy to, to use it, okay? 
as far as I know. So another testbed, which is actually, um, this is really more of a real network, so the pervasive nation is actually targeting Internet of Things. So the Iris testbed I talked about is more about um, the, the usual story, 4G, 5G, high data rate, right? Uh, but this is more about IoT, so not necessarily data, uh, high data rate, but maybe spread out sensor networks. Actually, I think they have um, a handful of real base stations they operate. So my center is kind of operating this network. And they do actually keep on adding uh, sensors. Uh, and they can measure different things. Okay? Uh, I know they use this for agriculture, for weather monitoring, and probably a few other you know, things. So again, they explain the, um, the story. Uh, so you, just, uh, you go to the pervasive nation website and uh, yeah and you basically see what they do okay so again you can can let me know and I can get you in touch with the, with the right people so these are two different teams each team would probably have in the order of 10 people so at least 20 people are working on experimentation all the time in my in my research center okay so probably more I'm just talking Trinity now but I think if you expand to Ireland it's quite a lot actually of people doing this so there is another university close to us somebody asked me about RF engineering so there is a group close to Dublin. It's like 40 minutes by train. Um, and those guys have an anechoic chamber. They have a massive MIMO test, but they're really into engineering. Uh, you know, while probably uh, we are in between science and engineering. So we have group that are really doing, you know, a lot of engineering design and they're more practical. Name of the speaker? Uh, I'll, I'll show you. So this. Uh, The university is called Minus, and May like the month, and then Nus University. Yeah. So yeah, um, and the professor that is leading this work I'm talking about is named Ronan Farrell, R O N A N, Farrell F A R R E L L. Okay. Again, you know, if you don't find him, just send me an email and then I'll tell you. Okay. Um, now, I have a, you might have seen it already, I have a website where I explain, you know, what I do. It's kind of basic. I, it's really more of a repository where I list things. Uh, so if you're interested in a paper, normally I put, it um, should be accessible either via IEEE Explorer or I, I put also the PDF if you don't have access to that normally. Uh, you can see the projects, uh, the PhD projects, the research projects, uh, what I teach. Should also be possible if you are teaching and you want to access my material, just ask. I have no problem with that. I can share as long as I can dig it out because it might be old stuff, but uh, I, I'm happy to share material. No, you know, if you just acknowledge me, my college and my center, that's it. You don't need to ask any permission. Just use it, okay? Um, fine. Same goes with PhD thesis. Okay, really, uh, don't be shy. You know, I, I, I'm happy to share as long as I can. So I, I have to ask maybe for something. Of course, if you ask me a patent, it's different, right? If you ask me like um, thesis, uh, master thesis, whatever. Okay, uh, as long as I can, I can find it because you know, as years go by, you have a lot of stuff, and maybe sometimes you, you lose it. Okay, but um, as long as I can find it and. It's, it's possible to share it, I will, no problem with that. Okay, um, yeah, other things. Okay, what is Trinity College? Um, you might know a bit. Um, it's actually the number one university in Ireland according to basically all rankings. Uh, we are the number one de uh, electronic engineering department in Ireland. So Ireland is a small country, but there are quite a few good universities. So we are, we are kind of top of the country and we normally get the best students. I mean, that's that's true. Okay, um, I think in general, um, it it is a very old university. So it was found founded in um, 1592. So it's uh, 420, 430 years old, something like that. Um, it was actually f uh, built based on the model of Oxford and Cambridge pretty much, so that it's a similar structure and you see even the buildings kind of look something like Cambridge and Oxford. It's a very nice campus. I'm going to show you some pictures. Um, we had a lot of uh, very good people uh, 
um, studying with us, including the current Prime Minister of Ireland, for example. It's very common that the President or the Prime Minister actually study in Trinity because it's like the one of you know, the top institution. Um, and we, ought, we had four Nobel Awards among our alumni. So we have one in literature, medicine, peace, and physics. Okay? So, of course, there are universities with more, but there are universities with less, right? So I think it's, it's quite good, actually, that we have, you know, uh, four Nobel Awards, among other, you know, um, good, good people that studied in, in Trinity. For example, the Princess of Japan studied in Trinity also. Okay, so. Um, so that's a picture taken by night. So this is like the bell tower. Um, for those of you that um, are familiar with uh, the Christian uh, culture, uh, you might know what this is, right? It's like basically similar to uh, where in the mosques you have like uh, a tower calling the faithful. So, so this is what we have for, for Christian churches. And, uh, and this is embedded in the campus, okay? So. In fact, Trinity comes from the concept of Trinity in Christianity. So th there is kind of some root. Nowadays, it's not so religious, honestly. So, but there is, you know, some root in that. Um, and there is a chapel inside the college. Many other nice things, actually. A very nice library. I'm going to show you. So it's a very lovely campus to walk by, and you know, it's, it's small. So here, I think it's 2,000 plus acre acres. Trinity College campus is 50. Okay, it's in the, inside the city. It's like you have a campus inside Delhi or in Cyclecat, you can't really expand too much. So anytime they build new uh, facilities, they have to do it outside the campus because it's very, very small, like Aritra knows what I'm talking about because it's been there, right? Um, so if you want, once I'm gone, if you want to ask more about Dublin and Trinity, Aritra will tell you, spend two months, right, with us. It's a nice campus, right? I think it's fair to say it's a nice campus, right? Aritra, yes, okay. Um, good. Um, so this is another picture taken. It shows a bit, you know, the, the perspective of the main square. There are other, you know, nice parts. Um, this is considered one of the <coughs> most beautiful libraries in the world. I think I'm not saying it. I mean, they, they, there is a ranking. So it contains actually a lot of uh, very ancient volumes. And normally you cannot access. So we have modern libraries where you can go and get a book. This is more for scholars you know, of antiquity, and uh, they might ask to get, you know, to get the book to study, but there is a procedure, right, because these are very old and, and rare books, so, and, um, yeah, so I hope that gives some idea what we do, and if you have more questions, I'll be happy to answer, and, uh, yeah, so, any questions? Comment? Nope. Okay, so we can start, I think. good for me to do a bit of promotion you know of my home institution since I'm traveling why not okay so I think we reached this point yesterday where we actually discussed the um, how they build the census tracts right so they they go after population in the SAS system so this is like the license shared version uh, of the story in US mm. so basically According to the population, you will have different uh, census tracts uh, number. So Manhattan in New York is very densely populated, so you will have more because they, you know, once there is some level of population, they change census tracts because you have to share the spectrum, not based on the size, but based on the actual people using it. So that's, I think, is a smart idea, and it's something I, I only saw in this uh, system so far. So spectral sharing has always been about the propagation and the distance and this kind of things, but eventually it matters more who is going to use it. Okay, so this study also we did based on this is more based on the population than based on the propagation. There is some there are some components of propagation, but the people are definitely important. Okay. So the idea is that you create some exclusion zones, they, they call them setback distances, and depending on the path loss, you will have different uh, setback uh, distances, okay? So, um, so if the path loss is, uh, so basically it, it depends actually on the, on the environment, okay? So you have um, this D distance, you see, goes according to the, Essentially, the power you use to transmit. So outdoor will have a larger one. Uh, there, there are some, you know, some rules uh, based on the propagation that give you this D. 
that essentially every operator will have a, a short term license, right? This is not the usual license. You are buying it maybe for up to three years. No more than that. It's not like these long licenses that operators buy nowadays. Um, there are power restrictions that are basically imposed by FCC. FCC is the US regulator, right? Federal Communications Commission. Um, and it's very simple actually what, um, what normal is done. Um, we, for example, in our case, we use free space path loss can do better than that, okay, but that, that's a start at least. So essentially what, what we do, we, we took, for example, these three cities, Washington DC, Manhattan, so New York and San Francisco, and, and we will try to actually create um, uh, census tracts, uh, which are actually non-convex polygons, because it's like a Voronoi tessellation. So you have basically the set of points that are closest to the uh, transmitter, given some constraint. So you might, you might actually have shapes that are a bit irregular, right? It depends also on the position of the transmitters. Um, so there are more details in the paper. Um, so essentially, the, um, what we care about, as we said, is more the, the, the usage uh, of, the, of the population, okay? So we are not really caring about propagation per se, we want to see how it impacts, how many users can, can use the spectrum. So the first thing you can do is to actually take into account how much of the area you cannot use because of these protection zones, right? So actually some of the area is lost because of these uh, guard regions. Mm? So we compute that with this ALP. So it's basically a proportion of the area that is wasted because of these guard uh, regions. And then you, you simply like subtract this from one, you multiply by the population and you get a rough idea of how many people are actually, you can actually serve with a license. Um, so we computed the um, CDF of um, this area loss uh, 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 basically, um, you know, uh, the, the loss factor, okay, of, of the area. And essentially what happens is like uh, you see for uh, Manhattan, so let me see. So basically you have the, this is like the CDF. So you have the probability of the area loss being less or equal than 0.18 sorry, the, the probability of the area loss being less or equal than 1 is 0 0.18. And then the probability for San Francisco is a bit uh, higher. But eventually, I mean, the, the, the thing is, you see, if you, if you actually increase the setback distance, the loss is kind of, you know, more, more radical. Um, so you have to think that this is a, a CDF, okay? So we are, you have to consider what it means for the probability of the area loss to be less. So it's not good that this thing becomes, becomes very low. Uh, there is a complementary story with the population. So basically, you see, if Manhattan was kind of losing more area, so that means actually that uh, more and more population won't be able to, to benefit uh, of this, okay? So this, uh, I mean, you have to think that this is a, a CDF, so you have to kind of reason a bit, okay, what this means, but essentially, um, if you are more, if you have more people, you, need, you, you will have more census tracts per area, and between neighboring census tracts, you, you have to have the guard space. The guard space is bad because this area you won't use for your communication. So the more dense is the, the, the more uh, census tracts, the, so the more licensing areas you have in, in a certain region, the, the more the loss will be. And at some point you have a, a situation where if you, if, you, you, if you have a setback distance that is too large and the, net, and the city is too populated, you are not going to benefit from this extra spectrum at all, okay? Because you are, you are just not going to use it everything is an exclusion zone in the end. Hmm? So I don't want to go too much into detail, 
So because it's, it, I think it requires that you read the paper. I hope I gave you the idea. Now, the main message here is that compared to the usual spectrum sharing approach, people come into the picture. I think that's the main innovation here. And then there are some different in archi differences in architectures compared to LSA and the usual cognitive radio. But I think the main idea is that uh, people are what matter. Okay, and, um, and that's, I think, it's, um, it's a good idea probably. Okay, it's worth, worth studying more. Any question? Okay. Um, so today, basically, we start the last module. It's, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we will go through it today and tomorrow. Um, it's called New Theoretical Insights. So these are basically tools that are being considered for 5G uh, and, and beyond. They are not necessarily uh, linked to the standard, of, of, to a standard of any kind. It's really general tools, more theoretical. Um, they might be a good idea if you want to, you know, learn something new and use it. But again, they are tools. They won't give you the problem. To do good research and the PhD or, you know, a postdoc, you need a problem first. And then you'll see which tools suit. Now, uh, in general, there is this tool versus problem community in research. Some people are very much about learning tools and they apply them everywhere. Other people are about chasing problems and then they find the right tools. Whether they have them or not, that's another story. If they don't have them, they will learn them. I tend to prefer the second approach. I think problems are more interesting than tools. Tools are just an instrument. But again, you have fantastic researchers and amazing professors that they are about the tools. So I think it's, it's up to your taste um, what, uh, what, what to do in that sense. So the first tool, we s so we're going to see two tools. There could be many more. Uh, I had originally, I planned to have something on this game theory, but we don't have time to go through that. Anyway, you have the slides and the references. Um, and I, I know much more expert people on that than me, if you're interested. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to tell you a bit about stochastic geometry today and how we use it uh, in 5G context, and then a bit about complex system science and how we use it. Now, there are people that have been working on, um, on stochastic geometry here, far, as far as I know, IIT KGP, right? Uh, Aritra, for example. Um, and Aritra is also, has also been working for the past couple of years on complex systems, right? Um, so you have actually local people here, you know, that uh, might be easier to approach than the me in Europe. Um, other people you could contact in general uh, about the physical layer and especially the waveform part is Sashank, who you know is, is doing very good work on that. And yeah, so and now I don't know all of them, but I know, you know, they, they all like do very good research. So it's, it's another way to, to get information you need. So what are the issues in a cellular network? So first of all, the, the, um, the word cellular refers to cell. And what is a cell? So what does it look like? Because I'm pretty sure yourself in this course and before, you saw all kinds of cells. You saw representations that were like circles, squares, hexagons, random shapes, right? Uh, so what is a cell in the end? Um, and how many users can you serve uh, in a cell, OK? In general, you will have uplink and downlink, right, depending on the direction of communication in a cellular system. You might have actually traffic that is of a fixed uh, bitrate nature, voice essentially, it doesn't really change that much. Or you might have traffic that is elastic, it might change a lot depending on the resources and the requirements. Uh, so data, for example. Mm -hmm. The users are not like uh, enchained to a specific position, so they reach a network, they stay and they depart. Yeah. Um, so. Eventually, if you want to evaluate the quality of service, uh, say the call, call blocking probability, you see the picture is kind of complicated because it will depend on how you define the cell. So the propagation model, for example, could be one way. Um, also the geographical layout, buildings, obstacles, scatterers. Um, it depends on whether the communication is uplink or downlink, or maybe if you have full duplex, both at the same time. Um, depends on the kind of traffic, uh, depends on the mobility models. Is it indoor, is it outdoor, is it mobile, non-mobile? Uh, is it like uh, something that uh, over, uh, like overcame 
the transient phase or is it within the transient phase? So what I'm saying, what I mean is like, is it users going to work in the traffic or is it users at work that do not move much? So you see there is, it's a very complicated picture. So there is the need of tools that help us a bit because even simulations go only that far. They go as far as uh, telling you, like speeding up computations, but you have to tell the computer what to do. You still need the model in the first place, right? It's not a magic tool. So you tell him, do this, right? You have to come up with uh, some model in the first place. So that's why also, you know, theoretical models like stochastic geometry are, are, are important. So it is a theory that has been there for a while. It's essentially a branch of applied probability. And it studies random phenomena in, in, on the plane or higher dimension. So you might have come across uh, I, I know there is a, co I mean, there was at least in MTAC here a course on teletraffic engineering, still there, yes? They have a part of uh, queuing theory, right? Which relies a lot on, um, for example, Poisson distribution, which is essentially telling you how the arrivals uh, evolve in time, right? As, as a random process, basically. Now, if you extend this concept to higher dimensions, like 2D, 3D, and so on, you have what we call, um, um, you know, um, general Poisson point processes. So you might have uh, actually a 2D process, okay? So you might have, instead of considering the time dimension, you consider space. Instead of considering the random event of arrival in time, you consider the random event of being in space in some position. It's been applied to many different fields. So communication networks is just one of them, maybe one of the most recent ones, but it's, it's been applied before in other disciplines. Um, classical models we are going to discuss a bit today is spatial Poisson, Voronoi, Boolean, shot noise, there are more. Now this is a very quick lecture, so you, you would need to go through you know, a serious book and set of papers uh, on stochastic geometry if you want to work with it. This is not enough, this is just a starter. Um, of course, um, the, the good news is that there is a lot of literature and quite a few people uses, uh, use this um, this uh, tool. So you would most likely find people close by that are working on this, you know, or not that far. So what is a spa special Poisson point process? So it is, as I said, a Poisson process on the plane. Uh, it has an intensity lambda, which has essentially to do with the density of, of uh, in this case, of um, points in a space. So when I say point, think of base stations, okay? So it's easier probably to picture it. Um, so essentially the number of points I in, a, in a subset of the plane uh, is a Poisson random variable with a parameter, which is the intensity uh, times some measure, measure of the area. So the intensity is like the density per square meter, and then you, you multiply by a measure of the area, and you get the total number of points, okay? It's like an integral. And it, it is a Poisson uh, uh, distribution, so this is a formula that should ring a bell for those of you that took uh, some courses on queuing theory or traffic modeling, it's essentially the same thing, right? So we just play with a different, uh, parameter, right, than, than before. Uh, a key tool to do work in stochastic geometry is to use the Laplace transform. So that's the difference compared to normal DSP, where definitely Fourier transform is king. In stochastic geometry, Laplace transform is, um, is, is actually the, the tool. So if you want to work on this, it's a good idea to refresh Laplace transform or study it if you didn't see it before. Normally, this is studied in, in the advanced mathematics for engineers courses. Normally, but again, yeah, depends on the syllables. So it's a very basic model. It's normally where you start from. It's not really the end point of stochastic geometry. So it kind of tells you how the users can be partitioned okay, over the plane. Uh, it's used, for example, to, to identify location of nodes in different kind of networks, location of base stations. Um, so why, why do people 
um, we have the paper club in the afternoon, which is about this uh, motivation of stochastic geometry. But why do people uh, come up with this? Okay, why, why did they even come up with this concept of of, um, of stochastic geometry applied in wireless? You see, they are good to model random deployments, and many of the current networks in 5G kind of resemble random deployments. <coughs> They are not def definitely the very structured order lattice-like deployments we were used to in the past, right? You might have a user deploying its own um, base station in the home. You might have dense cells that are deployed according to temporary need. Maybe there is a, a assembly. There are some people gathering, and then you install a temporary base station. You have sensors scattered throughout maybe an area. So this is definitely something that resembles sort of a random deployment, okay? So that's why people, they needed some kind of theoretical tool to better capture this. So if you just use your normal uh, honeycomb um, network deployment model, it won't work for this kind of, of networks, okay? So it's very simple, uh, of course, as long as you are trained, and, and it allows for quite a bit of um, uh, calculus. So you can actually get a good bit of, of uh, close form or uh, at least manageable expressions. Maybe not close form, maybe you get uh, an integral, uh, you know, based on, say, um, some something you know how to numerically integrate, but you get, in the end, you get an expression. So you might either solve it, close form, or you might simulate it, but it's something you, you know, it's an equation in the end. The Poisson, um, Model, though, it's kind of simplistic in terms of um, correlation. It doesn't capture that. So clustering phenomena are not going to be captured by this model because it considers all the points of the process to be independent, which is normally not what happens. If you do have a user close to a base station, very likely there are going to be others, yes? Uh, and and if you, you also have propagation. It's not that we are in a, you are in a vacuum, right? If, if you are close, you should actually... So, you see, the distance matters. So, the closer you are, the stronger is the correlation between the, the signal, right? Uh, because Just because of physical proximity. So, it cannot be that if you're collocated or infinitely far apart, it's the same thing, which is what happens with the Poisson model. Yeah? So, the Voronoi tessellation is uh, actually another model where you actually do these um, um, basically it's good to define it's like similar to what we did before when I told you about these uh, sensor structs it's kind of what we did there so basically you have um, it's a way to define the regions that are of points that are closer to one point than to another so you have this set of black d d dots here and you want to define the regions that contain the points that are closest to one black dot rather than another. And the way to do it mathematically is using, well, you compute the distances in this way, and then the, the points that clo fall closer to one dot will be associated with that, closer with respect to any other dot, and eventually end up with Voronoi squares. This is what, uh, what the name, this is what the name, this is the name of the thing. Okay, and that's another way you can actually model uh, kind of irregular deployments. So you could think of the Voronoi tessellation, for example, as a way to model uh, location of base stations, okay? For useful for cellular architectures. Um, a dual model, so something related, uh, is used actually as, uh, of the, a dual model of the Voronoi tessellation is used as a, um, uh, to create basically a graph of nearest neighbors, and this is good for routine purposes. So there are actually practical applications, you know, that are, are interesting. The good thing about Voronoi tessellation is that it do, it does take into account distance to the nearest uh, base station. So there is some model of neighborhood, which is, is good. It makes sense to define the cell as the area that is closest to the base station. One problem though, this is pretty much geometric, okay? So it doesn't consider real path loss, it doesn't consider interference, it's just geometry, okay? And it's not the same thing, right? 
uh, electromagnetic distance and, and geometric distance are not the same thing. So there is another model which is called Boolean. Essentially what you do, um, you have points and then you have properties associated to the points. Um, okay, so for example you could have the property could be the radius, but uh, not only. Um, essentially the way you can think about it is like it's, um, it's a generic wireless coverage model the points again denote the locations of the base stations and uh, the, grain, uh, the grains is like the marks, these properties you associate uh, for example could denote the coverage regions so it's another way to get a model of the, um, you know, of the wireless uh, propagation sort of now again we have a problem because these coverage regions are independent while of course if you have an overlap it's bad right because you are going to interfere with each other this is not captured here that's why here in the in the model the expression you have an XOR they discard overlaps it, it's the way the model works okay so that's that's something so as long as you have not you don't have significant overlap of the cells it's okay otherwise you have a problem so it's again a simple model allows for explicit calculus can account for attenuation effect because this kind of property you can associate to the point could be as we said the coverage itself region but it ignores interference effects as I said okay between overlapping regions uh, it has been used uh, it can be used actually as uh, for ad hoc networks for example and you could you could for example study phase transitions between connected or disconnected networks so you know there is some applicability so the shot noise model any question Shot noise model is um, it's again a marked process, so you do have points and properties associated to points. And in this case, for example, the property you could think of it say like the power of the node. So you could actually model interference, summing over the different points what the power s and then some attenuation that depends on distance. So it starts to get closer to something meaningful in terms of wireless um, propagation, right? Um, and you do have results, you know, they tell you, you can find actually the Laplace transform. This is important because the Laplace transform is what you need to compute uh, the network matrix of interest, yeah? So it is a very good model to, mm, for example, uh, for the total receive power. Because these, these SI correspond to the emitted power of a base station. The response function L is the attenuation function due to the environment. And you can actually enrich it with other wireless as aspects like shadow wind fading, usage of directional antennas. Uh, so it, it's, it's, it's a fairly general model. Uh, a, a related model uh, is the extremal um, shot noise. It's essentially instead of taking the sum you take the maximum of the received power in a sense you can model it like that and it's useful for example when you want to pick a link in a optimal in some sense uh, strongest one nearest best channel statistics right so for things like uh, for things like um, antenna selection um, right uh, or what is the name of the receiver that picks the best uh, branch is equal gain combining? Don't remember now. It's kind of based on louder. Yes, exactly. So uh, it could be good for this kind of thing, right? Um, yes. So I mean, you can use actually this kind of uh, model, for example, to to mo uh, to you know write an expression for the SINR. Um, and again, these things are not based on simulations, okay? Once you know how to model, you're done, in a sense. You might not be able to solve the thing, but you can always write the model. You don't need to run simulations, right? This, this is the beauty of this. So once you, un once, once you understand the model makes sense and you can figure it out, you're kind of done. You can reuse it all the time. That's why analysis is so powerful. Uh, difficult, to, you know, you have to train, you have to get the expression, but 
once you get the equation, you're done. And you can reuse it, right? Tweaking it maybe, but simulations are basically something you have to keep on doing, right? Um, every time you have a change in parameters, you have to, but you know, the equation, the change in parameter is already there. You change uh, the value of the, of the, you know, of the related part in the equation, right? So you could think of the, again, the points as antenna locations and um, you might associate, uh, you might write actually the SINR expression and find out, for example, for a coverage model, whether the SINR is higher than a threshold. If it is, you are within coverage. If it's not, you're in outage. Mm? Um, again, there's a shot noise model. So we saw this before. You might actually have an interference cancellation factor. So you might have, you might have, the, it's a simple model, but you start to have a model also that accounts for uh, DSP capabilities. You could have interference cancellation techniques and this could be modeled by this K kappa, right, uh, factor. Okay. So that's how it looks like if you start to play with this uh, model. Um, so if you increase, uh, so if you have, say, cancellation capabilities, which are uh, very high, so you have no interference, so you basically end up with uh, what we saw before with the Boolean model. So the shot noise model becomes like the Boolean model when you have full interference cancellation. Otherwise, you start to have less, you know, uh, like different shapes. I'm not saying even if it's uh, kind of doesn't resemble really much, right? Uh, what, what you end up with no interference. But essentially, so if you have a small interference factor, so you can cancel your interference, the um, a SINR can be approximated by a Boolean model. So this shot noise is very realistic, right? We are, we are very close to what we normally do when we define a SINR. Boolean model was much more theoretical. So what I'm saying here is that you can actually show that if you have very good capabilities in terms of interference cancellation, this is as good as the other one to model a SINR. This is a bit surprising, right? So that's, that's the, the point here, okay? Okay, now um, that's it. Okay, now to go beyond this, it would need a course on its own and I'm not myself a stochastic geometer. I'm, I've been using it a bit, but you know, there are people that are way more expert than me. So the idea is really to get you to know uh, uh, the, the, the existence of it. So just out of curiosity, how many did not hear about stochastic geometry before? A few, okay. So you see, it's a, and it has been there for a while, huh? So what you see, it's, it's still not probably mainstream in a sense, okay? And how about um, complex system science? The, who didn't hear about it? Okay, so again, again, some. So you see, there is a point even just to, to hear about it and then you can look into it. Um, game theory, I suppose, has been, right, that's very popular, right? So. Okay, but there was a time where game theory would have been like that. People would not hear about it, right? And then they see that the idea spread in the end. So we can use stochastic geometry to model um, uh, cellular networks as we saw. So the way we did use it was to use the simplest model, SPPP. So no real complication here. Um, we are happy to accept its limitations, okay? Because it's just easy to work with. Uh, so you can actually use it to characterize the probabilistic distribution of, of some metrics like a SINR, coverage, rate, area spectral efficiency, and so on. Okay. And um, what are the pros and cons? Well, the pros, again, you can write expressions pretty much for, you know, network metrics such as area spectral efficiency. It gives you an insight on network design because this is much more, clo it's much closer to the actual deployment than this uh, normal regular lattice, right? That we use uh, uh, in the normal simulations and studies. So just again, out of curiosity, when you model networks, okay, for those of you that do communication network um, work, what models do you use for deployment? Is it this usual, 
regular cell deployment. Those of you that do system level simulations, maybe. Yeah, which model do you use? Is it like this kind of hexagons? Yeah. Yes, right? So I, I think that that's nothing to be ashamed of because everybody does that, right? So that's where you start. But um, if you have to model like something more complicated in terms of deployment, that you cannot do that, right? So you have to, that's where these tools are, are actually useful. Okay. Um, now, the one problem with the stochastic geometry in general, um, and how we use it for wireless networks, it underestimates, uh, is, is that it underestimates the performance. So these regular lattice models, these honeycomb, hexagon based, they overestimate it, but uh, stochastic geometry, they underestimate it. So the real performance is in between. Now, it's more um, whether you want to have a more conservative approach or more reckless. Normally, for engineering design, you tend to be more on the worst case scenario, just to be safe. So that's why also stochastic geometry is becoming popular. It gives you a safer estimation of the performance of the network. Mm -hmm. One issue, especially with the spatial Poisson point process, is that the correlation among points, among base stations, is hard to capture, but it is there. So it can only be a starting point not to take co correlation into account. But if you want to be more realistic, you have to do that. So what you do, you come up with this kind of deployments that are, you know, for example, Voronoi-like. So you have this kind of modified squares. It is a reasonable fit in the end with real deployment. And you can even see it um, uh, visually because basically what happens is like um, um, if you, I saw actually this kind of, of comparison visually. So if you see a real deployment and you, you know, overlap uh, a model, you can see how much they look alike. And definitely stochastic geometry models are much more close, are much closer to the real deployment. You see it even visually, okay? Um, if you add actually correlation, even better. But definitely the regular spacing is nowhere in, in reality, even in the macro networks. I'm not just talking about these new networks. Macro networks are not deployed like that. You know, we had these people from Air Force, right? They were they are running the, their own network, right? This, and I had said, of course, they said, no way this uh, hexagon is the real thing. Right? It can't. Because, I mean, what happens if you have a, uh, you know, a, I don't know, a river? Or do you put the base station there floating? You don't do that, right? Or um, what, if, what if there is a forest, right? These are all examples where you can't, you can't just keep on uh, having a regular spacing, right? So you will have to cope with that. Or... What if you want to deploy a, a base station and it has to be in the kitchen of somebody? Likely they're going to deny the, the thing, right? Maybe they're kind, they allow you, but <coughs> most likely not, right? So you see, these are all silly examples just to tell you that, of course, this regular spacing is just an approximation, right? And uh, even, even in the macro cellular network, it's not, it's not the way it is. Hmm? So there is a point. Okay, so we saw quite a bit already about small cells and stuff like that. So we saw, for example, how to, what power you should use for each cell so that you have a linear area spectral efficiency gain. Um, we saw, for example, how you can scale the power and become power efficient if you have a dense network. At, I mean, how you can consume less power for the, full, for the total network if you have more small base stations. We saw the behavior of energy efficiency. So now we are going to add something to the picture because the, uh, as we said last time we discussed about small cells uh, studies, there is an issue to do with the fact that um, the, the path loss model is very simple. It's single slope and that leads to artifacts we can't believe in the first place. For example, spectral efficiency is constant regardless of the density. I mean, regardless means you can have one base station in the whole world or an infinite amount. It's the same thing. Now, that you don't have to be a, a genius in mathematics to say that you know, the math doesn't, doesn't work, right? Or another thing, outage. So outage essentially has to do with interference, okay? Also with interference. Um, so if you have, again, one base station in the whole world or an infinite amount, you're not going to see any difference. Again, something is wrong there, right? 
uh, other things that do not convince us is like you have a continuous increase in the air spectral efficiency, no matter what, always linear. Or energy efficiency never decreases, it goes up and then it stays at a certain value regardless of the density and so on and so forth. Okay, you can probably come up with other examples. So there is something wrong. It gives you some indication, okay, uh, but it, there is something fundamentally flawed in the model. So what happens if we change that? If we some start with something that accounts for the fact, for example, that sometimes it will be in line of sight, sometimes it will be in non-line of sight, which is a re more realistic assumption. Okay. Um, So that's what we did. So we extended this model from Andrews to incorporate line of sight and non line of sight propagation. And what we found, uh, not surprisingly, is that outages and spectral efficiency are not constant anymore with, uh, with the density increase. Here, spectral efficiency gain is no longer linear with the cell density. Mm -hmm. And we will see that. Um, energy efficiency is actually no longer saturating. It, it, it achieves a peak and then it radically decreases, which is more satisfactory intuitively, right? So um, I'm going to talk about the results in the next hour. Um, but, you know, just to, to, to finish on this, uh, introduction to stochastic geometry and how we apply it. So um, the number of points over a given area, it's uh, as a Poisson distribution of parameter lambda uh, measure of A, so where A is the area of interest. So the measure is normally the Lebesgue integral. It's an integral, okay, that's what it is. And lambda is the density of uh, base stations per area. Mm? So lambda is your Poisson parameter when you have 2D instead of 1D. So what you studied when you studied traffic model, you had a parameter telling you the, dense, the intensity of arrivals per time. We do the same thing, but it's just the intensity of points in a 2D space. And you can also show that if you are given the number of points n, each point is uniformly distributed over the area. So what, what do I mean by this? I'm basically saying that if you're so worried that you're not going to be able to do uniform distribution, you're wrong. Because actually, the, the uh, SPPP is a generalization of that. So you, you can fix the number of points, and you are ensured that what you get is a uniform distribution of points. Hmm? So you could, for example, use the same thing to uniformly distribute the base station or the users. Hmm? It's a generalization of the thing. Okay, so it, it, it encompasses what we are used to in terms of user distribution, for example. Okay, and now. Uh, this is like a visual comparison. Um, I honestly can't picture a situation where this is happening. Unless you have, uh, this looks to me more like when you have a, a solar panel grid, right? Stuff like that. But in the real wide area deployment of the communication networks, you're not going to have this, okay? Because eventually, you know, you have to see where the users are. You have to see the geography of the place. You have to get uh, licenses to install things. Um, there is legacy. You are not going to roll out a new network from scratch. You have ba base stations where they are, and you're not going to uh, demolish a building because you, your optimization model tells you the base station is better off five meters. Uh, you're not going to do that, right? So you're going to have to live with what happened in the past and what you can do rather than what you would like to do. On top of it, even if we could do that, it might not be a good idea because Users are not so, you know, again, you can't fix a user so that, okay, stay here so the pathos is good, right? You, you link, you, you chain the user to the, to the chair. You can't do this. So eventually, it's never going to be like that, okay? So that's a good question. I think now most of the work that has been done, uh, at least to my knowledge, um, it's been about making it more realistic on the base station side. There is also work, though, uh, which I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not familiar with, but there is work th where they use stochastic geometry for the user side. So probably they are also tackling, I think also the uniform distribution is not realistic. It's, it's a starting point, yes. It's a starting point as the regular deployment. It's no more than that, yeah, because eventually 
uh, they're not going to be, I think again correlation might play a role, where there is a user there are likely others, yeah? And uh, I don't think uniform distribution captures that, right? So it's equally, so it's equally likely that two users are very close as, the, as it is that they are very far, right? And that doesn't intuitively make much sense, yeah. It's only for simplification of mathematics. Exactly, and the same, the same with uh, this kind of thing, right? But uh, now, what I found out, and there are better experts than me in stochastic geometry, the math is not so dreadful. So I normally see people, uh, of course, you have to have a bit of a mathematical bend. If you're scared of equations, then not a good idea. But if you are familiar, you know, if you're good at math, I don't think Aritra, correct me if I'm wrong, would take you more than six months. I mean, to become, you know, capable of doing something, probably one year to become good. Mm. It's tough, but you know, to get the basics, I don't think it's yes. Correct, correct. But uh, I agree. But you know, the, the my point is like you can actually become proficient without. Uh, there are a few theorems that you keep using, like the exactly. Exactly. So you're kind of told you have to use this theorem, this tool, you know, it's not that it's so exploratory. It, maybe it used to be when they came up with the stochastic genre that we are using it, okay? Um, and that, that's true. I think, I think Karit is very right that you, if you complicate the model to account for interrelation of the station and users correlation, it gets easily more complicated. Um, and I think honestly, SPPP did what it could. I think if you want to get more out of it, you have to complicate the math probably. I, and that could be more complicated in, in the future. Um, yeah, they have a couple of theorems they keep using. It. The, the, this thinning theorem is all over the place. and It's like two or three, okay? So, and uh, we are engineers in the end, so we keep it simple. So, what, um, I suspect if you start to have other things, I'm not too sure because this is a statistical tool. Um, if it really can account for um, like uh, evolution in time, I'm not too sure about that. There are other tools probably that are better off. Okay, so you see, anytime you study, and uh, one thing that is important when you have mobility, it implies some history. Okay, you. So statistics is not about that. Statistics is about taking averages essentially. It, you, you look at the picture at a certain situation, you look at the picture at another, you know, at the scenario in another instant, and so on, and then you have a result. I'm making it very simple, but that's the, that's the concept behind Monte Carlo, okay, for example. And when you have a thing, so when you start to compute uh, CDF, PDF, you are getting rid of the instantaneous information, which might be dangerous if you are not so sure about the stability of your system. So there are other tools we are starting to work on, possibly also in collaboration with uh, IIT KGP, which are about dynamical system theory. Um, how you study the, the evolution of a system in time, but not averaging, you just want a function telling you how it evolves at any time, function of t. This is not what we have here. t is gone. There is no t here, okay? There's no time. Um, yeah, so I think it's a good tool now Suggestion from my side, be careful, because it's a very populated area. I put it in the syllabus of this course because I think, you know, it's worth to know it because uh, it's very popular, but it's probably been used uh, uh, even too much, okay? It's become almost a fashion and seems you have to have it if you want to publish some journals and, uh, and that's okay, but you have to also to be a bit strategic in planning ahead. You might be better off with less uh, uh, crowded areas, okay, this is a very, very crowded area, I, I must say, in, in wireless research, right? right? There's so much work going on, I mean, and it might be difficult to carve out. And another thing is that since there is so much work, you have to be aware of it before, before you do your work, which takes a lot of time. So the, the tool itself, I don't think it's so impossible to learn, but to get familiar with the work will take a lot of time. It's like if you start now a PhD, in waveform design or massive MIMO. 
it was much easier five years back. Now these areas are getting very mature, right? So, so that's why to find out topics a bit under investigated might make your life easier. Still, you can do good work, but without uh, spending like two to three years to before you start work. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to tell you what we did uh, in the next lecture, and then uh, in the break is now. Um, so we have a 10 minutes break and then we can have uh, Q&A and also there are a couple of people that have to present uh, about the paper club yesterday. One is you and another one. You too, yeah? Okay, good. So let's take a 10 minute break. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so welcome to the second session of today. Um, this is the third to last lecture. So there are two more lectures I'm not going to cover in the course, 19 and 20, because you know we don't have time for that. So, but if you if you want to go through them and ask me something, uh, welcome. Okay, I'll uh, we might discuss them in the Q and A or you know or maybe offline after the course. It's up to you. But the course will stop at lecture 18. Okay. Um, so tonight, I mean this afternoon, we have the last paper club at four. Yeah. And then we have the dinner at Vikram Shil at 7:30. Mm -hmm. And tomorrow we have the again the usual story like lecture, Q and A, and then lecture. And then in the afternoon we have the exam at three as far as I remember and then morning session, exam. morning session is the same right oh is that true afternoon there is a lecture uh, didn't know that okay. so, ah you're asking if we can do that uh, fine I, I don't know what do you think Sushan I think it's uh, yes, that's a valid question. Yes, it's on everything, but the up to lecture 18, uh, 19 and 20, I'm not going to cover anyway in the course. So I think it's fine. We can have the exam before if they prefer. So what do people prefer? Do you prefer to have the exam in the afternoon or, or you know, at 11:30? So we keep it as it is, okay? So we'll have the usual structure and then the exam at three and then the valedictory at the end, okay? Good, and then we are off to our respective uh, home places, okay? Um, so I introduced stochastic geometry this morning, so I'm going to tell you how we applied it to dense small cells. Um, so again, the question is whether things like linear area spectral efficiency gain or increasing energy efficiency aren't maybe too optimistic, right? Um, does it seem reasonable uh, that if you increase the density indefinitely, possibly to infinity, this doesn't have any effect on uh, 
real performance, right? That there is there is something that we are missing. So in fact, these results are the consequence of, of a simple path loss model, which, which is based on a single slope. So essentially, it's a model where in, uh, in logarithmic scale, the path loss at a distance d is given by some constant plus another constant times the logarithm of the distance. And this, um, this b is like what is normally called beta, is like the path loss. Uh, exponent. Yeah. Now, previous work in, on cell de densification showed that the linear gain doesn't hold with models of the channel that are not single slope. So, this linear area spectral efficiency gain is actually there because of a too simplified channel model. Mm? So, changing that thing should change. So now, first, let's recap what we know happens. Uh, what we know is, uh, you know, it happens with a single slope path loss model. The area spectral efficiency increases linearly with the density of cell uh, deployment. The outage probability is, is independent of the cell density, which means if we plot the outage probability versus the cell density, it's an horizontal line, it's a constant. And the energy efficiency is actually something like similar to sigmoid, so it goes up, and then it kind there is a flex, and then it becomes kind of constant. Uh, that's what we saw happening with a single path loss, uh, single slope path loss model. Mm, well, out as here we define it as the probability of SI and ARC being uh, lower than some value. Okay, that's the way we define the, the outage. Normally, that's the way outage is defined. Either the SI and ARC or the throughput is, is lower than some value. That's, that's a common, common definition, I think, for outage. Yeah. Give me a full screen, right? It's easier like that. So, the. Um, so again, we, we did study the, um, what happens uh, using stochastic geometry as a model for deployment. And we do have uh, a line of sight, non line of sight propagation model. So it's a probabilistic model where with some probability we are going to be in line of sight. And with one minus that probability, we are going to be in non line of sight. What we found is that if you have this kind of um, model, which is more realistic because you have the possibility to be also in non line of sight, um, the area spectral efficiency gain is not linear anymore with the cell density. In fact, it is more than linear at lower cell densities and less than linear, sublinear, at high cell densities. And this has to do with the fact uh, with how the so essentially what happens is that if you densify the network, it's more and more likely that line of sight will play a big role also for interferers. So that's where actually uh, you will start to have nasty interference effects. It, it's reversed at low cell densities. It's actually being better than you expect. Okay, so it's because now you have line of sight and non-line of sight both playing a role. With a single path loss model, it doesn't even make much sense to talk about line of sight or no line of sight because it's one single set of values. Okay, so you don't capture this distinction. And the energy efficiency does something like it has a peak. So it goes up to some value and then it decreases. So the system model um, is. Uh, is basically simple. So we have a network of small cells. The base stations are distributed according to the spatial Poisson point process, so kind of probably the most basic uh, model from stochastic geometry, SPPP. The users are uniformly distributed. We do use reuse one, so every cell transmits over the whole bandwidth because um, we are more interested in the performance limits than in effects of resource allocation uh, that we will might study later but uh, for now it was more about um, 
understanding the limits if, if you know no special condition is there if you start to play with this uh, with reuse uh, patterns with frequency allocation now you might see performance effects due to that rather than to the density of deployment and the propagation conditions right because if you become very very good in the way you cope with interference you're not going to see interference but that's against the purpose of this study in the first place right we want to see how propagation and densification play a role mm? so we we do not uh, we, we shouldn't touch uh, resource allocation really until we understand uh, the the performance limits and the same with the other assumptions so fully loaded network uh, it means at least one ue is being served by a base station so there is no base station that is inactive again if you don't take this if you don't consider this assumption and you start to have base stations that are inactive and you're studying energy efficiency now energy efficiency could be low just because not many base stations are active but that doesn't tell you much about the effect of densification and, and propagation right interference full buffer traffic same story so we want actually that if if base station uh, has some bandwidth available it's going to use it all if you have non full buffer traffic like if you, if you have uh, fractional uh, load models then again you might see a decrease in the area spectral efficiency just because you are not uh, transmitting enough the throughput might decrease because of the traffic assumption not because of, of the cell densification and propagation effects yeah uh, and then we connect the users to the strongest signal which is just the thing that makes sense I think so the then the line of sight non line of sight path loss model is actually we take the one from 3GPP um, where they have an equation which has uh, attenuation factors of a certain kind for line of sight and attenuation factors of another kind for non line of sight and um, you are in line of sight with some probability PL of D which depends on the distance D and the expression is the one I give in equation 3 so you have actually something that is, is uh, you know, it, it, it decreases like the plot we see on the left. So it's kind of a, um, <coughs> sort of like a decreasing sigmoid. So it goes, there's a flux and then another flux, it goes to, goes essentially to zero at some point, okay? It's, uh, if you increase the distance, it's very unlikely you are in line of sight. Um, and then we, we plot actually how the path loss looks like if you have a single slope or a double slope model. And uh, the light blue curve shows the average between line of sight and non line of sight. So you see there is a transition. And at some point, if you increase the distance, you move from a situation which is line of sight to a situation that is non line of sight. So you, at some point you, you transition between the two regions, okay, the two re, uh, regimes. Um, yeah, they give you the value in this model. Uh, I think I might have the value somewhere. Uh, maybe not in this presentation though. But definitely you're going to see <coughs> KL and beta L are going to be lower than K and L and beta and L because line of sight is attenuating less. I can't remember it, yeah, but it's, it's going to be smaller basically. Okay, so the, the, you know, you, you might have actually different models telling you different values. I think the RCPP suggests some values, but the, the, the important message is that the line of sight attenuation is less. So KL is going to be less than KNL and beta L is going to be less than beta L. Hmm? And then D0 and D1 are like some distances they give you in the model. <coughs> and and D is the, is the actual distance uh, between the user and the base station. Okay, there are more details in this 3GPP uh, report. So we are using stochastic geometry essentially to compute the SI and R. 
it's, um, it's kind of the basic block okay, of anything we do in, in wireless. CyanR tells you the throughput, it tells you the uh, outage, and uh, it tells you the energy efficiency probably to some extent. Uh, so it's really like the building block of, of the performance analysis. So there has been work by Andrews uh, um, and others where they model the CyanR using stochastic geometry. First work is uh, 2011. And we, we had to modify that to incorporate this line of sight, non line of sight propagation. So that's what we did. Um, so you do have the concept of typical user, which is like uh, some user. So you kind of assume the position of the user, and then you, you consider the base station positions to be random. So the user is normally located at the origin. It doesn't matter, it's just a convenient. Uh, trick okay to get the nicer map you can put the user wherever you want um, and then the uh, basically the next step you have you you will assume that the closest base station is serving the user and that means that any other base station is interfering and will be located more far away so you allocate you, you associate with the closest one and anything, anything else will be more far away and will be interfering. What is it, the, the appearance is? Um, I looked it up yesterday. I think I'll look it up again. I can't remember it uh, off the top of my head. Livniak, I think it's Livniak and another guy. I don't know, Aritra, if you remember what... Correct. Okay. So, uh, right. So, so it's invariant basically to the choice. Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. Thanks, Arit. Um, so the the next step actually, you are going to compute what we call uh, what is called the uh, the inverse cumulative distribution function. So the CDF is essentially the probability that the random variable is less than some value. The ICDF is the other way around. It's the probability that the, that the random uh, variable is greater than some value. Okay. Um, so you could, for example, given that uh, you could compute this, given that the distance between base station and typical user is uh, capital R, what is the probability that the SI and R is greater than some value? If you ever is over all the possible distances, you will get the absolute uh, ICDF. So it's not the conditional one anymore. You just average over the distance. So you will get the probability that the SINR is greater than some value. So the full expression is, is, is this. So you basically, you have to average over the possible distances. And for that, you need the probability density function of the closest base station distance, right? Um, and then you can actually compute uh, the um, ICDF. So it turns out the expression is uh, is what I'm showing here. So the essentially the SINR is given by some coefficient, which represents the Rayleigh fading. And then you have your attenuation parameter in line of sight because we assume the serving base station to be line of sight. Um, and then you have the distance, and then again the uh, path loss exponent, the noise. And IR is just the interference condition on the fact that the closest base station is at capital R from the user. Hmm? Yeah, makes sense. Okay, good. Now, this is fine, uh, but there are some things we have to actually uh, cope with, and mainly what I'm going to talk about is the first two points. So, first of all, this probability is a bit nasty. This PL of D, even it doesn't look that nice. You have nonlinearities involved, okay? You have minima, 
you have actually exponentials and exponentials of the kind e to the minus 1 over x, e to the minus x, so it's not so easy to, to treat this. So what, uh, what we did was actually to, to change that and to make it more reasonable in terms of mass, still hopefully without changing the situation so much. It's an approximation I'm going to talk about. Um, the second thing is like that uh, the, um, the user might be, uh, I mean, the, the we assume the user to be in line of sight with the serving base station. And normally, that is also the base station that is the closest one. But it might, you might have the case where an interfering base station is actually closer in terms of Euclidean distance. So you could have an, a, a, an interfering base station which is in online of sight. So you are not going to get the strongest signal from that, but still the base station might be closer than the serving base station. And that is something you don't like. Uh, in, in the model, so we are going to do some modification of that so that it doesn't bother us too much. And that's something I'm not going to talk about, but you might have to do something also if you want to deal with non-homogeneous SPPP. Now, homogeneous in terms of Poisson processes means that the intensity varies. So, in an homogeneous Poisson process in time is a process where the arrival rate doesn't change with time, essentially, okay? Uh, and in the case of a special Poisson point process, it means that you are going to have, if it's non-homogeneous, you're going to have a density that changes with the, with the position. Okay? So it, it's something we don't, uh, I'm not going to talk about here, but you might have to, to change that if you want to use Andrew's model. So we approximate this kind of function that it doesn't look too good with something simpler, where essentially you have... Um, you see, you have an exponential of minus d to d divided by capital L squared. So d is the distance. What is capital L? Capital L is a parameter that actually captures the line of sight likelihood. <coughs> so if capital L is, uh, it's a distance. Yes. Right, uh, you might. Now, the thing you have to check, I mean, there are two things, okay? There is, one is the, the approximation you add has to be validated because the, the 3GPP model is based on, uh, on realistic considerations and, I guess, measurements. So, you should try to match with that. So, if you change that, you have to show you don't deviate too much in terms of the line of sight probability, right? That's one thing. The second thing, you have to show... Uh, you, you have actually to have an expression that is easier to manipulate, right? So you need both. So you need uh, an easier math uh, to work with, but you also need to show that if you plot it against this 3GPV model, this blue curve, you are not going to be too far. Yes? That's important too. So what we did, we changed, uh, we used this uh, parameter L and then we, we kind of found that, uh, well, it changes, but for example, if you, if you have a certain value, you're not too far, so it's not too bad, okay? But uh, basically, we also have a more flexible model. So the 3GPP model is given, and it's that. Um, though you might have some something you can do with D0 and D1, but we, we have a parameter that captures explicitly line of sight likelihood. So what happens is, if capital L is larger, we are modeling a sparser environment. It means an environment where you have less clutter, less obstacles. So it's an environment when capital L is larger, where it's more likely to be in line of sight, even if the distance is large. It's, it's kind of you have a clear path, clear view, okay, in the network. Uh, the other way around, if, if uh, capital L is small, you have actually your model in an environment which is cluttered is an environment with a lot of obstructions where actually beyond some distance it's very unlikely that you are going to be in line of sight. 
Okay, so it kind of models somehow the, um, the line of sight situation in the environment. And this plays a role, okay, this plays a big role in the results we're going to see. So, now, what you do to tackle these, these issues is actually to have, uh, so again, the issues are, so the first one we, we discussed, okay, so we want uh, easier probability of line of sight uh, expression, and that we, we discussed now. The second one, what happens if the inter one interfering base station is actually closer than the serving one? So what you do, you can actually, okay, first of all, you will have uh, in, in uh, you will have two special uh, Poisson point processes. One has to do with the points, so the base stations that are in line of sight. One has to do with the base stations that are in non-line of sight, okay? Um, and you have another theorem which is, uh, you know, normally used in stochastic geometry, it's called thinning, but actually you can break down uh, these, um, these two processes and you can have a process which has uh, density, um, the density for the line of sight, essentially deployment, which is the density of the overall process times the probability of being in line of sight. And you can, you can do the same thing for the non-line of sight points. And it's, again, the density of the overall process um, multiplied by one minus, uh, actually, I think this is uh, not correct. I think this should be L. Anyway, so you basically have the probability of being in non-line of sight, which is one minus the probability of being in line of sight. So, and this is a consequence of the thinning, prob uh, thinning theorem. So you, you can basically, uh, you have a certain uh, overall process, you might have sub-processes, and the density if you sum the densities of the sub-processes, you end up with the density of the original process. Okay, that's something you can do because of the thinning theorem. I, I don't know the intricacies of the theorem in mathematical sense, but, uh, but it helps with this uh, sub-processes situation. And it's one of the very common tools you use in stochastic geometry. So what you can do now that we, are, we know this, you can actually map non-line of sight points into equivalent um, line of sight points with a weaker power, so to speak. So we can actually map um, this red point into another red point which is more far away and it will have an equivalent distance which is larger. Because I mean if you are non-line of sight, even if you're closer, the, sign the, um, the attenuation is going to be high here. So it's, it's, it's as if you are in, in line of sight, but more far away. Yes? Because what matters in the end is not the Euclidean distance, it's the electromagnetic distance, it's how far you are perceived in terms of radio signal, right? So by doing that, then the math turns out to be fine. And um, you can actually compute the, the PDF of the, um, of the closest uh, base station. So for example, you can compute the inverse cumulative distribution function of the closest base station. Let's say you want to know what is the probability of being further away than this minimum distance. Okay, so you can play again with the um, line of sight and non-line of sight processes. We assume them to be independent, which again could be arguable, but that's what we do. And by doing this, you can actually, you see, you are kind of computing, so this B of 0R, it's a ball, so it's like a circle, essentially, centered at 0 and with radius R, okay? And uh, you are counting how many points are within these regions, okay? And uh, eventually you get the, so you see, Um, so what you're saying here, you want the probability of the number of points in uh, with, within a certain region to be zero, because you are you are calculating the the probability density function for the closest base station. 
So if it's the closest, nothing within that radius should be there, right? So that's, I'm, I'm simplifying the story, but that's what we are doing. Yeah, that's why we are saying the probability of phi L is zero, right? Because you are, count, you are counting how many points you have uh, within the region. And if it's the closest base station, it means nothing else is there, right? Uh, so that's what we are doing. Then you can actually compute the um, actual probabilities and they turn out to be not too difficult to compute. So you are essentially integrating the density uh, of the process. Um, yes, and one thing actually, one point I mentioned, the uh, tackling on, on non-homogeneous SPPP. So non-homogeneous again means that the density is variable. So that's what we are doing here. So the, the overall density is actually fixed in this lambda, but we are playing with the line of sight distance, right? The, the, the distance essentially, which has to do with the fact that you are in line of sight or not. And, and that's why the process has now become inhomogeneous because the density of line of sight is a function of x of the distance now, yeah? But because of the thin in theorem, we are not cheating basically when you sum them is still uh, so it's like an homogeneous process, then you have two, you know, two independent sub-processes and they are inhomogeneous. So that's, that's a consequence of the thinning theorem. And, and um, okay, so we do that and eventually, so if you have an inhomogeneous process, it means you have to integrate the density to get the, um, you know, to, to, to get the number you want, in this case, the uh, the probability that no point is within your, your area. So you integrate this is like what you do when you have an inhomogeneous Poisson process in time. If the density of arrivals changes with time and you want to compute something, you, you, have, to, you have to integrate this versus time, right? You need a number in the end to get, to get what you want. Um, and what do we want here, by the way? It's an SI and R value. So you, you, you can't really do much in terms of the overall network performance if you do not have a specific value, right? So you do need to integrate and to get the CNR you want. So that's what we are doing here. Eventually, this is a CDF or an ICDF anyway, but you will need to, to uh, uh, basically differentiate that with respect to the minimum distance R to get the probability density function of the closest base station. Okay, so just in a nutshell, that's what we do to get the PDF. And then you plug in your PDF. Uh, here. And you get the value you want. Okay, um, now this is the math. So we have details in the, you know, there is actually, pap we have papers, we have a thesis. So, you know, I'm making it, uh, making it a bit short here because of time. But if you're interested in knowing more, I mean, I can share more material and, you know, we have the details there. So but what you do with this eventually, you can study um, what happens in dense cell deployments with, with the realistic channel model now. Yes. What is the problem if you multiply it to exponential? Two exponential functions are multiplied. Yes. That means they will become added. Exponential up will become mm. In that way, this is yes. again, yes. Y yes. Both yes, you can do that because they are the processes are independent here. I mean, we assume them to be independent. Mm. Yes. Yes, you're right. Um, it will become a sum, yes. Uh, this is not uh, zero, so this is the probability of having no point. no point. So basically what you're, so this phi L of B zero R, what is it? Okay, B, B of zero R, it's a concept which in math is called the ball. 
like a circle, okay, in the 2D plane, right? But it can be a sphere in the 3D plane. So a ball is like a, uh, an interval, okay? So in the 2D plane, it's a circle centered at zero with the radius of capital R. So that's what B of zero R here is. So phi L is actually the, the process, and essentially it, it counts how many points you have in, inside this ball. So if phi L of B zero R is zero, it means no point is inside that. And that's what we want because we are saying we are after the PDF of the distance of the closest base station. So if, if the closest base station is a distance capital R, nothing can be there between zero and R, right? It's the first time we encounter, correct? Anything else is more far away. So if I just check how many points are there, I want to know what is the probability that I'm getting it right that no other point is there, right? Uh, if um, the higher this probability, the better is the assumption that um, that's the closest one, right? But if, if this probability is actually very high, sorry, very low, it means I'm doing something wrong. It means I'm not uh, picking the closest one. Maybe I have to pick another one, you see? Yeah, make sense? Anybody else? Okay. Sir? Yes. Sir, uh, here we are assuming that uh, line of sight and non line of sight have like same characteristics because uh, uh, in small scale hearing effect means uh, because of that line of sight and non line of sight will behave. Well, they are they are different in the sense that we use different. Um, values for the attenuation coefficients. But even if I get same SI enough for line of sight and non line of sight, its effect on B R and everything will be different in both cases. Is that true? We don't capture that, yes, yes, yes. yes. So uh, I think you're right because you would have uh, for one thing I suppose multipath will play some role, right? Um, Possibly shadowing is going to be a, so I think these are the things. Now, I think shadowing somehow is incorporated in the normal stochastic geometry models. I'm not too sure about multipath though. Um, so yeah, could be could be that picture changes a bit. Yes. We do have some. I mean, it's not related to this work, but similar in the sense we have a similar kind of work for dense networks in millimeter wave. And we also do a bit of stochastic geometry, a bit of system level simulations, depending on what is possible. Uh, we had a paper in Globcom, and um, that paper is without fading. But we are writing a journal now, and we consider fading. Uh, I don't know to what extent. I don't think we could manage to do much with stochastic geometry, but at least we checked with, uh, with system level simulations. and. It's not that the impact is so much. I mean, it's, it's changing the um, absolute values of things. So for example, if you compute area spectral efficiency or coverage, mm -hmm. you will have the curves going up and down. But if a system, if a setup has a better performance than another, that won't change. So you just kind of scale everything. Yeah, so of course it has some implications, but um, not huge ones, as far as we could see. Now, it could also be that the models we use for fading are maybe a bit simplified because in millimeter wave you have other effects like um, micro mobility, breathing, uh, anything becomes uh, possibly a block, uh, a blockage, right? And so, but yeah, the, the first impression is that it doesn't change too much. Um, one thing though, uh, my impression is that, e I mean, that's just uh, my feeling because uh, again, um, there are people more expert than me in stochastic geometry. It's a good tool, but it has its limitations in terms of applicability. So what I know, for example, is that path loss exponents that work uh, and that give you basically a closed form expression are kind of special cases. I remember like the four, apparently it's a good number, but it's not that you have a general thing that works for any path loss exponent, for example. And shadowing, I didn't fully get the picture, but it seems to me it's not again something so straightforward though they say so but 
I, I don't see it really very well modeled. Uh, and, and fading, I'm not too sure what's going on. So, you know, the, the, there might be some limitations in how much you can incorporate uh, multipath fading mobility. I was discussing with Debzania. I'm not too sure how much you can do. I know people have been working on the user side which is more about mobility, for example. Uh, we did, we are doing some work in this project I mentioned on millimeter waves, so changing the carrier. So people are trying to do something, but again, what happened with that work, at some, so I think we are pretty fine with single blockage. Uh, so a single body blocking, possibly you can, I think you can extend into multiple, uh, you know, bodies blocking, but I don't think we managed to have a, a general model for all the networks. So maybe it's more special cases. That's my impression that you have to, for example, say the users are maybe in this circle around the base station and uh, you see this kind of things. I'm simplifying things, but when you go, if you want to have a general uh, SINR distribution for all the network, for any kind of obstacle, I mean, including multipath mobility, not so easy. Huh? Um, so, and to be fair, honestly, even without stochastic geometry, I don't think this is easy. So, right? So, it has its limitations. So, you have to, you have to probably before embracing it fully, you have to see whether it suits your purposes. I think you should be aware of the literature and the limitations, and then maybe a way to do research on this is to extend the model. But you know, if they didn't manage so far in ten years might be difficult, right? So, yeah, I think you have to, have to be aware of the limitation. Yes. Yeah. Yes. This? No. This. This. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that far over? Yeah. That's G, which one? So which step is it? Step three? Yeah. Yes. Correct. So let me see. So you are you are talking about this? What is it? Uh, This one, yes. So a far of R, a D over D R of P. Um, I think it comes from the fact that normally the, I, I should check, but normally the derivative of the CDF is the PDF. Here we have the I CDF. I think that, yeah, this is probably why. I mean, I think we have the reason in the, you go in the paper, probably in an appendix, we derive the things. Definitely in the PSD thesis, I think it's because you are doing ICDF inverse. Con <coughs> yes, but it's because this is not what you normally do. What you normally do, you wouldn't have this. You would have P of R less than R. That's the derivative. Yes. So the derivative of CDF is PDF. Yes, I think you're probably. In that regard, that the JD and the they have actually derived the rate of in that appendix. Yeah, I mean, it is basically ICDF is like the probability of being greater than something, which I think is one minus the, which is also called CCDF. Yes, yes, I think you're right. Yes, it's, it's also called CCDF. Correct. Yes, 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 exactly, exactly, exactly. It's because of that, yes. You have one minus uh, the CDF, so then becomes uh, minus, yes. Yes, correct. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 
Um, we didn't do that. I think what would happen, you might have to define possibly so if yeah yes yes what you could i think they have something like that honestly in the paper we are going to discuss this afternoon they have something about that right um so what you what you do i think you could have something like a parent child process something i think so matern um yeah so you could have like the parent which is the macro and the children are the pico, which are normally around that, because they cover the, it's like hotspots that cover the, um, the um, gaps in coverage in that, in that cell. You could think of it like that. So they are going to be a child process of the, of the macro base station process. That's one possibility. We didn't work on that, but I think, yeah, that's probably one way you could do things. Um, or I don't know if it makes sense to have some hybrid model like stochastic geometry and something else, maybe uniform. I think the way they are, I mean, I can check just to be sure because I think I saw it in, in the paper form. Yeah. Yes. So you see what they do, well, I'm not sure it's what they do here actually, but here they have a model for uh, at, at net, right? Because you have femtocells and you have a base station. So they are basically saying that uh, base stations are modeled by a PPP. But that doesn't tell you much because I mean, they have just one large base station. So let's thank you. I think I remember that thing. So they have also this Poisson plus Poisson cluster. So what you have is that PPP represents the users in a macro cell. Yeah, and, and the cluster process represents femtocells or hotspots. That's another way you could do it. Um, I'm not sure if I probably said something before. Let me see. I don't think I covered that. I suspect what the, this, you know, parent-child processes could be useful, but we didn't work on that. So I think you have, you have a first layer where you actually deploy, you, you model the, um, the process of the base stations, and then within a certain neighborhood, you have another kind of, uh, you have another stochastic geometry model for the, for the smaller cells, okay? And, uh, and you know they are going to be within a smaller area. So they, they might be work on that, I just didn't work on that myself, I suspect there might be some, some more. Maybe we can do a quick check, because you know, if we know what to look for, then we might find actually something. I kind of remember something like that. Mm. Oh, I don't find it. Anyway, so, yeah, ch check it out. There could be. I'm, I'm pretty sure there is some literature on on these approaches. I kind of kind of rings a bell. I think the paper six seven the reference of uh, they do that. Correct. Correct. So, but do they use actually stochastic geometry? No, that's not the reference. Okay. Side, side. I think I, I probably read this paper at some point. I'm not sure we can access the PDF from here, but you can see the abstract list. No, the PDF is not available, but... Mm. 
Tu dai jūs to kas tik geometrį. I'm not sure they used to cast geometry or um, maybe not. But you know the um, yeah, so there might I, I suppose there must be work on stochastic geometry for a headnet. It's just I didn't we didn't do it, so I, I can't comment, but I would say probably this again uh, uh, processes where you have you know a parent process and, and and the child process might be a good idea, but yeah, I didn't work on it, so I can't say too much more. Is there any other question or comment? Okay. Um, so, okay. Now this is the technicalities, and you know we can discuss offline if you want to know more. But the the point was like to introduce realism in the model, and see if we can get a better insight on the metrics. So, for example, if you if you check what happens with um, spectral efficiency. Okay, so this is not area spectral efficiency, this is actual spectral efficiency, and you plot it against density, what you notice is that it first goes up with the density, then it goes down. This is not what you see with a single path loss uh, slope model, single slope path loss model, because it, 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 would, it would be constant actually. So this is something you see because we introduce more realism in the, in the model, and in sparser sparser propagation environment, so lower capital L, it means it's more likely to be in, uh, uh, actually this, this is a typo, it should be higher, okay. So if you, are, if you have a higher capital L, so it's more likely you are in line of sight at a far away distance, so what does it mean? It means that you need less base station density to get the best result because the line of sight is good. It goes far away. So you don't need to deploy too much because likely when you deploy something, the, travel is go the, the signal is going to travel very far away. And of course, if you, if you change this picture and you start to have a more cluttered environment where line of sight propagation is not so good, then you might have to deploy more. Maybe because at some point you find walls, so you need a new base station, right, to overcome the problem, stuff like that. Um, so of course, you will if you consider the peak of the spectral efficiency, for more cluttered environments, you will need a higher base station deployment, which means the curves are shifting to the right in that case, or to the left in the other case. Yes? Yes, it's not even a trade-off. I think it's a consequence of the, uh, of the environment. An environment that is more line of sight is better so it's always better if you can push it to the left. There is not really much, much uh, good ha happening on the right because you're just deploying more. It's more costly you know, to deploy more fiber and the line of sight, I even the peak value goes down because the environment gets challenging. Okay? So in that case, the only thing you can do is to deploy more. If the environment is better, you can deploy less. I think that's what this, curve, th this plot is saying. Uh, similar story with the respectral efficiency. We want it to be linear, possibly super linear. So what happens is again, if you have a good environment with nice line of sight properties, higher L, for lower densities, I mean, you achieve the higher value, uh, at uh, a lower density, say you get, you get the best uh, option for, um, uh, line of sight situation, okay? The picture changes if you increase the density because it's um, what happens, I think, in that case. So this area spectral efficiency, so you have, you have the area being involved and essentially what happens is like you have to consider what the interferers are doing, okay? So if you increase the density to have a very line of sight situation might be bad because you are increasing the power of your interferers too. Hmm? And the more you increase the density, the more you are in a troublesome situation because only one base station in this model is your serving base station. Anything else, if you have 100 base stations, 99 will be interferers. Hmm? So it becomes difficult if the line of sight is good, in a sense. So you see, that's why you have this different behavior at lower density and the higher density. 
At lower densities, line of sight is good. Yes? At higher density, line of sight, in a sense, is bad. So that's why the best results you get with the more cluttered environment for higher densities. Yeah? So it's, it's a different picture. So there is a transition between a network that is actually non-interference limited and a network that is interference limited. So this is another kind of message compared to these, uh, these curves. We also checked out as, again, out as probability would be constant if you had a single slope, path loss model. It's not constant at all if you have a more realistic line of sight plus non-line of sight model. And what happens again is that at the beginning, then you find the network is good because you are going to get closer to your base station, right? But beyond some point, if you densify too much, you're going to get very close also to interferers, which again will bring down the CINR, which again will bring down the outage, uh, um, well, will bring up the outage probability, right? And down the coverage probability. So if you want, if you really need to densify, but there is a point in densifying the network. If you notice, area spectral efficiency goes up. Maybe it goes up a bit slowly, but it keeps going up, okay? Uh, this is what we could see. So if you really focus on throughput, you want to densify the network. But then you have to cope with outage. So what you might have to do then is start to play with frequency reuse, MAC. You have to do, mayb or maybe you actually need uh, a better phi. You need interference cancellation, but you have to do something. If you want to densify the network because you need throughput, you can't accept an outage probability of 60%. That's useless, right? You need actually to have also a decent outage, so then you might have to play with MAC. It's something we really didn't do, but I think that's a good, good still a very valid uh, area of research if you want to work on that. Any question? Okay, um, energy efficiency. So, Okay, first we study, like we, we basically have, um, uh, we, we, we saw this kind of picture before when we had a single slope path loss model where you have a linear increase of area spectral efficiency and actually a decrease of the power uh, uh, per base station, but the, ch the picture changes in terms of not being linear if you have line of sight and non-line of sight. So again, the picture is less trivial and you start to have super linear, sublinear behaviors. Um, more interestingly is what you do in terms of energy efficiency. Energy efficiency is like combining these two things. You have the throughput and you have the total power consumption uh, in the same metric. So what happens is if you have a single slow path loss model, we know that it's, it's going to go up energy efficient and it saturates. And we are not convinced about that because interference might play, should play a role. So in fact, if you have a more realistic model with both line of sight and non line of sight, the, um, there is a peak in the energy efficiency like what we saw for spectral efficiency. Yeah? And again, there must be a relation because spectral efficiency is part of the energy efficiency. And it goes down. Now you can say, wait a minute, but you just told me here that if I increase the density, no matter the propagation model, I kind of become more, I, essentially what I can do, I can shrink the power because the distances of the cell to be covered go, uh, become smaller. So I can become more power efficient, yes. But what I'm saying is like the, the loss in the spectral efficiency is too big for that. So if you have a very big loss and the modest gain and you divide them, the, the big loss will win, right? That's what is happening here. So for some regions, it, it's a good deal to densify because you gain throughput more than, than uh, let's say you, you probably actually gain both ways, okay? You gain throughput and you reduce the power consumption. If you increase the density beyond some point, what happens is you are still reducing the power consumption, but you're also dropping quite a lot the throughput you can achieve because of interference. So it will go down. So what emerges is that, it, again, 
cell density, if you take the proper channel model, becomes a, a design parameter. You can decide, given the um, requirements you have, and given the propagation environment, you, you see what is the best cell density for you. It's not monotonic. It's not always good to densify the network. And maybe you want to say something like, OK, I don't want really to have expensive interference cancellation, so it's better. I'm more, I'm more conservative. I don't deploy too much because I know my phi is not going to be that good, yeah? Because I have simple, uh, um, simple uh, cancellation capabilities, okay? So you, you can decide, you know, where to push depending on energy efficiency, on outages, and, and, and also the, how much you want to complicate your network. Because if you start to complicate phi and Mac, you can push the density, I think. But you, you have to pay a price in, in terms of computational complexity, signal in overhead, right? If you apply frequency reuse, you have to kind of communicate between adjacent base stations. And this is not like the macro case. You, you might have actually hundreds of base stations in a certain building, right? So it starts to be complicated to, to picture this. So to finish this part, now we, we stop uh, for today. So we did apply some simple uh, model of stochastic geometry. We consider what happens if you make the channel model more realistic so that it, you have both line of sight and non-line of sight possibilities. And what we saw is that aerospectral efficiency is not linear with cell density. It's actually super linear at low densities and sublinear at high densities. The outest probability becomes really very large for increasing cell densities. And the energy efficiency has a maximum value, and so does the spectral efficiency. So if your goal is to maximize spectral efficiency or, min or maximize energy efficiency, you have to be careful in, uh, in over-densifying the network. You might have to stop at some point, unless you start to play with um, other things. So right now, we didn't do anything with spectrum allocation, reuse one. We didn't do anything with phi beforming. So you, but so, of course, if you add that, you can get better, but you're also going to get a, a more complex network to, to, to deal with, yeah? Okay, other question, comment? Okay, so if there is no further question, then we take a break and we meet again at four for the last paper club, okay? Uh, yeah, we good? Okay, so see you at four. Thank you very much.